Um, we'll now begin recording the interview with Lindsay Brewis. The recording takes place on the 17th of January 2017 at SNAP headquarters. The volunteers present are Lara Taffer and Rob Body, and this recording has been collected in oral history and will be part of the Chronicle Project, a project led by VCS Cymru and funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, Lindsay, if you could give us your name and just tell us where you were born. Well, my name's Lindsay Brewis and I was born in Rudder, just outside Cardiff. So, yeah, um, I was at that stage a local girl, not anymore. There you go. Okay. Um, you're obviously working for SNAP now. Could you just tell us a little bit about the organisation and its history? Oh, yes. Um, back in 1986, um, the National Charities uh, Scope and MenCap were being inundated with calls from parents in Wales mm -hmm. about the difficulties of navigating special educational needs pathways to extra support assessment and, and good practice. And they obtained um, a lottery fund to set up SNAP Cymru, the Special Needs Advisory Project, as it was then. It's not a project anymore. But um, I think they got three back-to-back -back, um, lottery funds to keep them going in the first years until they established themselves and, and got some sort of more statutory funding. Uh, I went to the second ever meeting. There were two inaugural meetings. The first was in, Car uh, in Swansea, mm -hmm. where it all sort of kicked off from. And then the second one was in um, Pontypridd. And as a member of the local authority and as an advisory teacher, for parents and children with special educational needs. I went to that um, second inaugural meeting and um, Midler Morgan, as it was then, uh, signed up to become a partner and to promote the use of Snap Cymru to the parents we were in contact with. So I took it up from there as the promotional person to keep in touch with Snap Cymru, uh, encourage parents to use the service. Um, being an advice giver myself, I was very strongly in favour of having an independent voice. So that I said to parents, go and check me out. If they're telling you anything different than I'm telling you, then one of us is wrong. And we need to find out who's wrong. And Because actually the rules apply. The rules apply, that's it. It isn't like they've got their rules and we've got our rules. The rules apply. And I found that an incredible safeguard for myself as an officer of the authority, for the authority and for the parents. And it worked really, really well and I've supported them ever since. So um, I left the local authority in 1996 and went to work for Scope okay. as an education advisor and of course at that point they still had a seat on board and as the education advisor I, and I lived in Wales, I got that seat on the board so I became a trustee in 1996. So you've been involved basically from, from, from the work? From almost from day one. Yeah. In terms, in terms of, we've obviously spoken to some of the volunteers who work for for SNAP at the moment, mm -hmm. work with SNAP at the moment, and they're very, they have their own views about how they fit into the organisation. What contribution do you think they, as volunteers, make to SNAP? Oh, it's incalculable. It's first of all, it brings diversity into our workforce. Um, we don't pay very much for a charity. It means that retired people and people wanting to get back into the workforce, uh, people seeking to diversify their, their work-life experiences, and particularly parents who've gone through the pain and difficulty of sorting out the child's needs being met, come to us and bring all that life experience to us. They are empathetic, they're prepared to listen, Parents immediately bond with them and it's just over the phone or back through a text. They know they're talking to someone who's been down, down that road, you know, and um, they make the best, basically they make the best employees mm -hmm. because when they come to us, they learn from us, we give them all the training we give our staff and they, so they have their diverse backgrounds, they have their passion for supporting schools, families and, and young people and they give it freely, and I think there's something about being a parent talking to someone who is giving this freely, who isn't there to make a buck, who isn't there to um, massage figures or 
point you in a direction. They're there because they care passionately and that comes across every single time and the families, the feedback from families is, I knew I was talking to someone who understood, I knew I was talking. This person understood where I was coming from. Mm. They'd stepped in my shoes, they, they'd done my journey and um, yeah, uh, we can't afford to employ that many people with that sort of expertise and, and, and passion, I wish we could. Yeah, you mentioned this expertise and passion, that's obviously come over to some of the interviews we've already mm -hmm. done. But they need, they need something else, and you know, they need some training and, and oh, yeah. guidance. Yeah. What sort of training do you provide? Well, we provide a 12-day induction course um, over the first um, three months of their uh, time with us. So that's usually two two-day formal courses with an experienced member of staff or an experienced volunteer. So I could provide these courses, for example. Mm -hmm. um, taking place as close to where they're going to be working from as possible. So we, it's a travelling fair around the country. Um, taking place bilingually for those who may have um, Welsh as their first language. Um, the, we start off with the basics. What are special or additional learning needs? Um, what is the law? What are the regulations? You know, what are the rights and responsibilities? So initially, that's where they start with the sort of training, that sort of four days training. Then they spend a, another eight days researching their own local area and finding out how that... So for example, in Ceredigion, they don't have a special school in Ceredigion. So if you're sort of training a volunteer or a member of staff in Ceredigion, you have to th they have to go and research that they don't have a special school. They can't tell parents, oh, you'll have a special school, your child, can, you know, they have to know their own area. So then they, um, th those further eight days lead to um, a level two accreditation. Mm -hmm. And um, also then they are evaluated. So somebody, a senior member of staff or a senior volunteer would sit with them while they're talking to parents on the phone and evaluate their not their competence, but their confidence. Um, and one of the volunteers you saw this morning, um, it, it took her four weeks with us before she'd answered the phone. She's one of the most competent people we've got now, you know. But her confidence, her competence was always there, but her competence had taken a knock. And so we build their competence, we mentor, we pair them up with others, we train them. From there, you can go on to take any training. You, people must take um, mediation training. They must take advocacy training if they, if they go if they want to go into those areas. Um, exclusion training is offered to everybody. Uh, there's a whole range of training that we offer. Um, we offer uh, disability specific training like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or autistic spectrum disorder or working with children parents of children with Down syndrome and if they're interested in those areas they can come along and we have a, a huge success rate in people either becoming employed by us or actually going on and getting very good jobs, probably better paid jobs elsewhere yeah. um, because our training is well recognised and local authorities send their staff on our training as well. Okay, yeah. okay my next two questions. Oh. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. <coughs> Um, you mentioned that the part of the part of the training was to kind of research the local area. Yes. Do you think those kind of those links between volunteers and their community is something that that, that could be strengthened by volunteers working within the community? Absolutely. It's it's a very important part. Um, for example, downstairs, um, two people you've already met were, were talking about a, a young asylum seeker and saying that he really wanted to learn a musical instrument. And immediately they were searching their knowledge of the local acute community to see where they might get him a free musical instrument and where they might get him free tuition um, and how that could happen for him. Now, the, the strength of belonging to a community is brought into Snap Cymru and particularly through our shops. And you're not unfortunately interviewing shop volunteers today, although you could if you wanted to take this further, um, is that these people are very much of their communities, they know about their communities and very often people will walk in off the street and see our shop, start talking to us about what they want to do, what we do, and then say, oh, well, I could give you a few hours and volunteer. Now these people bring a tremendous strength uh, of their 
presence in the community and this feeds through into the casework because we have a very broad base to draw on when we're looking at and how do we support. You no, know, support for a family doesn't just come from a school. You, you, you know, you're not going to beat poverty and deprivation and despair it, from, from nine till half past three, no matter how good the school is. Family support comes from the network around the family. The more we know about those networks, the more we can point people in the direction of, um, well, you might get support here, or, you know, this church, um, even though it may not be the church you belong to, you know, has a very, very good community support. You might want to go there, and they would help you. So that knowledge, that intimate knowledge, being passed out um, to those in need, it's a vital part of volunteering, isn't it? You can't get away from it. From what you're saying, I mean, it doesn't sound as if you do have to recruit volunteers. Most of them just turn up and come to you. But if you do have to recruit, how do you go about doing that? Well, we have re we go to recruitment fairs. Mm -hmm. um, so anything organised, you know, um, community service volunteers, for example, might organise. We advertise on things like um, WCVA, you know, um, in the in the various local areas, and they they keep a database of our current volunteering opportunities. But we do need to recruit some volunteers. A listening and sympathetic ear only goes so far. There are complex cases um, where families are in desperate need of very particular regulatory advice. Um, for example, what is appealable at the uh, Special Needs Tribunal of Wales, right? Um, now, if you can get an ex um, special needs teacher or special needs advisor or special needs coordinator um, as, as we do have in our volunteer group these people already come with that knowledge mm -hmm. therefore they if they meet a complex case they don't have to go and seek advice um, a listening ear would always have a trained and experienced member of staff or, or volunteer and we don't discriminate between paid and unpaid people um, it's what you can do that counts. Um, so in their early days, the uh, the team downstairs would pop up and see me and say, what's the regulation on this? Because they knew I'd have it in my head and much quicker than going to look it up. Um, and yes, we have some very experienced volunteers who come with a wealth of background knowledge. And sometimes we actively recruit those, particularly for our helpline. Because at helpline, they come from all over Wales, uh, sometimes from other countries seeking to move into Wales and wanting to know what the setup is and how it differs and what they need to do. Um, presenting you with anything from, I'm a bit worried about my child, to I've got a tribunal next week and I don't know what to do. So it could be the whole gamut. And so the helpline staff and volunteers need to have some knowledge in their heads. Otherwise they spend an awful lot of time looking up and asking. Um, so yes, we do actively seek um, specialist volunteers and, uh, and I probably always will, mm. but because uh, it takes time to train your own. Yeah. We can get there, but it takes time. Yeah. I mean, you've obviously got you know, a really full working life at the moment, but in terms of your personal experience of volunteering, do you do volunteering anywhere or have you, or you are a volunteer? I am a volunteer. No, I am a volunteer. I, I volunteer. I, I started volunteering as a member of NEC from Scope in 1996 right. and I became vice chair a few years later. I'm, I, I am a, a trustee on the National Executive Council. Um, I volunteered as a trustee and in pieces of individual work and training um, throughout the years that I worked but uh, just over four and a half years ago I retired okay. and since then I've been in full time. Volunteer. I come in. I come in every day. Um, could you tell us just a little about what volunteering means to you? Well, I think that I can remember volunteering as a child with a church youth group, and we used to go down to a Leonard Cheshire home to um, just talk to the residents, really. Um, and I can remember that sort of being my first introduction to volunteering when I was probably 14 or 15 mm -hmm. and uh, that was something that was really 
uh, important to what we did then. Um, I've had very, very busy work life and I think that I, I found not coming through my work, um, both with the local authority and with um, when I went to work for Scope being so closely associated. But once I got into this line of work, it absolutely resonates with everything that I've wanted to do and done in, in both my working and volunteering life. It's, it's about empowering people to have the courage and the confidence to put forward their views for their child, to make sure that they feel that someone gives them back control over what is chaos when they often come to us. So volunteering for me fills an incredible need in my personality that I need to help people. Mm -hmm. It's part of me. It's not, it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It is a thing that is embedded in the way that I have lived all my life. The way I've worked, my family, my extended family. Um, the other volunteering I did was for um, the EF Foundation, Educational Foundation, where they look for volunteer families to take on students for a year from abroad. And I think over that time we, we worked with that foundation as volunteer families. Um, we probably had 12 or 14 young people come and live with us for at least 10 months of a year as family. And um, I'm still in touch with some of those um, young people uh, who are now in their 40s and 50s. So, yeah. uh, so that, that was another sort of... So I think I've always done this. Snap Cymru volunteering is incredibly re rewarding. I think because of the data we keep and the surveys that we do, we do get the feedback that you don't always get. Um, you get the feedback from the people telling you that you have helped them to make a difference for their child. That's, that's one of the most rewarding things. And it's just a great family to come to. You can leave your own great family and you come into a different great family. And everybody helps everybody else. It's, it's, a, real, it's a really nice place to be. I mean, I don't know why anyone wouldn't want to be with us, to be quite honest. It's lovely. You mentioned that you, what your first experience of volunteering was, was as a child going to the Leonard Cheshire home. Yes. How, what inspired you to do that? Was that something within the family or was it just something you felt? You no, no, the, um, the youth club, it was church youth club, the mm. youth club had an ethos of introducing their young people to volunteering and they gave you different, um, different ways in which you could volunteer. I did the Duke of Edinburgh Award, for example, and volunteering is part of the Duke of Edinburgh Award. And so that they, they set up volunteering opportunities. I. As a child, I always gravitated towards the children who had special needs in school, in the playground, and wanted to help them. So as a teenager, being offered the opportunity to uh, volunteer in a Leonard Cheshire home and um, interact with people who perhaps were being isolated from families and friends seemed like a good thing, and it was, it was a wonderful thing to do, and I, I think it was a, a fantastic charity to go and volunteer for at that point in my life. Do you think that you obviously volunteering has played a major part in your life throughout? Yeah. Do you think that, that that that's inspired other people you know or other members of your family to well, go on and volunteer? Well, um, yes. Um, my son, uh, my oldest son, came to uh, volunteer for Scope when I was working there, and uh, when I was working out of one of the Scope schools in Cardiff, he came to volunteer there and, and introduced off-ground touch to children in wheelchairs. Uh, the head teacher came to tell me, he said, you want to come and see what your son is doing in our hall? I'd go, oh my gosh, you know, I've let him loose on all these children in wheelchairs, what's he doing? I think he was about 15 at the time. And when I got in there, he had organised off-ground touch for children in wheelchairs, and he had everybody running about, all the staff, all the learning support assistants, and the children screaming with laughter. And he just put mats down, and so you wheel the wheelchair onto a mat to be off-ground. And, and that, was, that was just... A real celebration, you know. Yeah. My, my daughter um, uh, used to volunteer with me when I worked in a special school and she used to come to the 
when I worked, uh, I used to be a trustee for MenCap when I was younger, um, and she used to come along there to help with the children. And uh, she's now an Alzheimer's nurse, has gone on to, uh, you know, again to um, give back to the community, and I think that comes from her contact with people with special needs. Um, my son George came here as a volunteer uh, when I was unwell, and uh, my my role and another role had disappeared. He came to do that, and he now works for us um, and continues to help in his spare time as well. Often comes in with me on a Saturday if I need him. Um, and my daughter uh, Lorelai, who has her own um, mental health problems, um, volunteers in her own way by. Um, disseminating surveys on the internet and getting people interested in events by uh, doing that in, in her own way because uh, she's agoraphobic and, and doesn't want to leave the house. But yet my whole family has been involved in volunteering and, and I think are the better for it. Mm -hmm. it. It doesn't make you a better person but it makes you feel better about being the person you are. Okay. Yeah, I mean, kind of, we'll be kind of, you know, tea and cake. There must be frustrations. What do you find frustrating about it? I think I find frustrating the reliance that the statutory authorities place on charities who add value through volunteering. Um, comments like, well, even if we don't fund you, you'll still be there because you've got volunteers and, and your volunteers will carry on doing this work. We don't need to fund you. Well, people like me don't cost as much as a member of staff costs, but we still have costs. We have to have a building to come to, we have to have a team around us, we have to have training. Um, you know, scope pays that the appropriate expenses for volunteers, there is a, a meal allowance, there is a mileage allowance, um, and, and we don't exist in, in isolation. You need, you need a body of people moving in a direction in order to join. You, you don't suddenly start to do this from your back room, you, you know, that doesn't happen. And I do think that governmental um, apathy in naming the third sector and all its volunteer support, you know, volunteer support doubles the output of Snap Cymru. There's no doubt about it. So we're paid to do so much and we double that through volunteering. Yeah? But apathy in thinking that this just happens will result in it not being there when they want it. And that is a, a frustration and a, and a real sorrow because I have seen very, very good charities go to the wall. Charities on which people depended. Charities on which local and national government depended. Mm. And suddenly they're looking around and saying, well, they used to do this and they used to do that and we used to refer. Yes, you used to. But, you know, it's not free. It's cheap, but it's not free. Uh, and what about the admin side of it? Is that something that... that... <laughs> I, I'm trying to find a way to put it politely. That people get bogged down in. Is it something they find frustrating? I know that lots of volunteers and volunteer organisations have to go through lots of hoops to get things done. Is that the case? Well, it's, it is. Um, charities like ours can't afford full-time HR departments. Um, so keeping a record of uh, charitable giving, the mm -hmm. hours, is really done through volunteers filling in their timesheets. Volunteers don't like filling in their timesheets, particularly when many of them who, who walk perhaps to and bring a sandwich to work don't claim anything from us. We have lots of volunteers who claim nothing even though they're entitled. Um, now, if they've done that, they don't see why they should fill their hours in on a timesheet. And therefore there can be a frustration in actually valuing the volunteering appropriately when we come to look at volunteering as, as adding value. Um, we know there are many, and, and our trustees are the worst at this. You say, well, how many hours did you? Well, we had a two-hour meeting. I said, yeah, but how much reading did you do for that two-hour meeting? Oh, well, you sent me a yeah, so how long did it take you to read that? Oh, that took me about six hours. So, well, that's volunteering. So they think it's just turning up that's volunteering, but actually volunteering is commitment. You know, you may spend three hours on the train getting here and you've read all the papers. Now, that's three hours of volunteering because you wouldn't be ready for the meeting if you haven't read all the papers. So 
trying to get volunteers to value what they give can be quite, you know, oh, I just popped in, I only did a couple of hours, there's no point in writing that down. But actually, every hour counts. Mm. And um, we, we do value volunteering, obviously we've got the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Award for volunteering. We were the only charity purely uh, Welsh-based to get that award in, in the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Award. Uh, yeah, and we're very, very proud of that. Um, we we value our volunteers. We, we give them training. We we give them good references when they when they move on, and um, and sometimes they they dip in and out, and that that's absolutely fine. Yeah, there's always paperwork. There's no more paperwork to volunteering than staff. You know, it's mm. they are people. And people have to be protected in the workplace, and that means you have to keep account of them. You have to look after them. You have to mentor them. Um, you can't take on a volunteer and just give them a pile of papers and say, get on with it. They're not going to come back. You know, if, if you spend time with them and you tell them, you know, wow, look what we've done today because of you, they're going to come, aren't they? And, and that's, that's where we want to be with our volunteers. Um. Could you perhaps just chat about what do you think um, SNAP's impact has had within Cardiff, within the Cardiff community? Well, I think it's had a big impact because um, we couldn't, we couldn't reach uh, already this year after six months in Cardiff, we had reached six hundred families. There is no way that paid staff on their own can do this. So I think the impact in Cardiff is huge. Um, it means that more often than not there is somebody to go to an important meeting. There is somebody to sit on an important panel and make sure that the parents' view is represented. And at the same time, there is somebody to answer the phone to the desperate parent who's ringing in. Now, you can't be in two places at once. All of these things are important and the the team of Cardiff volunteers um, and Cardiff staff work together as one to make sure that as often as possible we are in two places at once because we, we aim to, to double up our capacity through volunteering. Mm -hmm. um, I think also that it's, it's been an outlet for parents of children with special needs who come to volunteer for us to gain the skills to make career changes, to gain confidence in thinking of going back to work. And in Cardiff, there is very often work to be done, but changing careers or changing pathways is difficult. And through volunteering, I know a number of people who have either come to work for us or who have changed pathways and gone on to do incredible things. One of our original um, volunteers is the director of SNAP Cymru. Uh, one of our um, first volunteers went to work for the Children's Commissioner. So um, Cardiff has played an enormous part because it's got such a big and varied caseload. Um, the training people get here is, is excellent and they really, if they're, if they're shiners, we polish them up and they can shine. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've kind of touched on this before in, in terms of what volunteers bring to volunteering and what they get out of it, but could you just give us kind of your pocket definition of volunteering? Volunteering is a gift. It's something that people give freely. It's something that they give because they care. Um, volunteers receive respect, value, enhancement, and also they have a chance to magnify what they care about in the real world so that they can go out and genuinely support change. And working people are more restricted in supporting change. They, they have less control over how, when and where they will support the changes they want to see happen. So this two-way street of receiving and giving is in constant flux, it's in constant motion. And that's the dynamic of volunteering that is so exciting. Okay, thank you very much. I think, I think we're done with the questions.
Is there anything else you'd like to add to? No, it's been a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. And you. Thank you very much.